Good evening everyone, uh, tremendous pleasure uh, to be here. Um, when Cameron got in touch to invite me, I was absolutely delighted. Um, I've never, never met Philippa, but in preparing for the lecture, I was tremendously impressed by the calibre of previous speakers. It's really something quite special if you look at that list. And as a former Dean, I know very well that the first one or two lectures of this sort that one does, it's actually quite easy to get top speakers. To do this year in, year out is actually a tremendous compliment in itself. This speaks very, very powerfully to the, the, the tremendous regard in which Philippa was held. And really actually following on, Tony, from one or two things you said, I think, again, very unusually, it's a combination of the extremely high standard of scholarship, but allied to very special personal qualities. I was struck uh, in speaking at a lecture in Sydney uh, last weekend um, in chatting to people. I mentioned to numerous people I, I was doing this, and numerous stories of Philippa's kindness and encouragement came across uh, nearly 20 years later. Um, so, absolutely tremendous. I also noticed, though, um, in, in reading a very powerful eulogy, that she was also the shrewdest of critics. So, she's sitting on my shoulder here to make sure uh, I do a proper job uh, this evening and, and, and don't uh, uh, drop below that, that standard. I'm also delighted to be visiting this fabulous university for the first time. Um, in an age where many universities claim to be top at this, that and the other, this is a university that has a genuine global uh, reputation, an absolutely tremendous reputation. And it's been delightful to meet some people again and meet other people again, particularly Philippa's family. So, as Cameron's uh, introduced, I want to comment this evening on developments in the law of the employment contract to describe what had seemed to be an emerging new world and to suggest that as far as the common law of Australia is concerned, Australia having embarked and gone towards that new world seems to be now moving in a, a somewhat other direction. First of all then, what, what is or was that, that new world? As Cameron's mentioned, uh, over the last 30 or 40 years, several jurisdictions of a similar nature, such as the UK, Canada and Australia, had taken a somewhat different view of the law of the employment contract. They had focused in on particular features of the relationship, such as, for example, the inevitable disparity of bargaining power, the fact that the employment contract concerns personal relations, and the fact that for a significant number of employees, it's not simply about the work wage bargain. The employee potentially gains so much more from the workplace, the workplace as a community, the workplace is a chance to both use your skills and actually enhance your skills and all the satisfaction that comes with that. By way of eloquent explanation, uh, the Canadian Supreme Court has perhaps been at the forefront of articulating these developments and explaining why they're important. Way back in 1987, um, the Canadian Supreme Court told us that a person's employment is an essential component of his or her sense of identity, self-worth and emotional well-being. And in the more recent case of Matthews, to which I return, um, they confirmed that they are still very much of that view. Those developments, which became reflected in areas, as Cameron has mentioned, such as the law of implied terms, allowed one to say that the employment contract was relational. Um, perhaps a convenient badge, perhaps more than that. And the, the Canadian courts were early adopters of some key academic works, such as uh, the seminal work Canfroy's Labour and the Law, where 
this notion of disparity of bargaining power as a hallmark of the employment relationship is stressed time and time again, with the consequent concern and fear that employees are vulnerable to unfair treatment because of that disparity. Nowadays, dicta to the same effect can be found in the Supreme Court in the UK, but the Canadians were well uh, ahead of the game. For a number of years, it appeared that direction of travel uh, in Australia was on a similar path. And again, one way in which that was demonstrated was the discussion and reference to disparity in power. And in uh, Russell uh, against the trustees of the Roman Catholic Church, which is from 2007, again, the same reference to Can Freud, and not just a reference to Can Freud, but a very full quote from um, the great work that laboured in law undoubtedly is. The court feeling it, it, it uh, sufficiently important to mention from Can Freud that the individual worker brings no equality of bargaining power to the labour market and to this transaction central to his life where the employer bar, uh, buys his labour power and going on to say that the employment relationship as a result, given that disparity, is an act of submission and so on and so forth. By the time we get to 2013, the, a majority of the full court, court embarker appears to accept that the implied term mutual trust and confidence was now part of the law of Australia. The term of mutual trust and confidence or similar formulations had been important in both the UK and Canada and imposed stronger obligations of a fair dealing type on the employer and actually applied to a wide range of practical situations that arose in the workplace. But the overturning, as Cameron's mentioned, of the full court and bark by the High Court of Australia has set the common law of Australia, I think, in a very different path. And we've seen that in decisions of the court in subsequent cases such as Rosato and the recent classification cases uh, such as personal um, contracting. It's also been the case that this conservatism, which I will argue um, is now a feature of the philosophy of the High Court of Australia, can also be seen when they deal with general contractual doctrine. So it's not just that they are taking a cautious and more traditional view of the law of the employment contract. They also seem to be set on a view that contract law as a whole should be viewed in a, in a somewhat cautious and traditional manner. And, it, and tonight, um, I'll try and actually set out my view on what differences to the future direction of travel in Australia that new approach is likely to uh, lead to. But I've framed tonight's lecture um, in terms of the notion of the relational employment contract. That's partly because I say that uh, relational contract theory became a con convenient way, I think, to badge the new developments in the law of the employment contract that I've mentioned. So first, I think I need to say a bit more about relational contracting before I get into uh, greater detail about the Australian journey. For many years, uh, relational contract theory was very much a province of the academic world, and it didn't stray into, as it were, the world of, of, of the courts, the world of the judges. But in a number of jurisdictions, by the time we get to you know, 2007, 2008 and so on, that changes. And nearly 20 years ago now, in a UK case called Johnson against Unisys, uh, Lord Stain describes the contract as relational. And in various cases since, that appears to be accepted in the UK and elsewhere. For a number of commentators, that then led to the view that relational contract scholarship and theory might inform the development of the employment contract much more firmly. There were many who believed relational contract theory held particular uh, relevance for the employment contract, and moreover, was a means of explaining 
modern trends and developments. It's certainly the case that much that has occurred in various systems has been consistent with relational contract scholarship. Relational contract theorists say that if you have a relational contract that sets certain higher expectations of behaviour between the parties and that can be reflected in stronger obligations of fair dealing. And mutual trust and confidence as an applied term would be an example of that. The modern approach to contractual interpretation, the factual matrix approach, is also said to be consistent with uh, relational contracting. And I certainly think that in Canada, in the UK and for a time in Australia, the way the law was moving was very much in line with the values that are said to be associated with relational contracting. So, for example, um, in Australia, if, if we look... Um, at some of the earlier decisions, um, one judge saying that the employment relationship involves elements of common interest and partnership rather than the traditional conflict and subordination that we associate with the employment contract. And that's consistent with the view that parties in a long-term relationship, which employment will often be, but perhaps not as much as it used to be, and if you're in a long-term employment relationship, you'll tend to behave more as if it's more like a, a partnership. It's also interesting to note, though, that at this point in Australia, and there's an important difference here, I think, between Australia and Canada and the UK, that a lot of the interesting decisions which might appear to be uh, pro-relational contracting are actually in the commercial arena. Cases like the Marconi against GCE case, um, ones where there's moves towards um, an automatic term of fair dealing in certain types of commercial contract are kind of forcing the pace more perhaps than cases in the employment uh, arena. And I'll come back to the significance of that later on. When it was last in Australia, which was seven or eight years ago, I would have envisaged that the employment contract or the law of the employment contract in Australia in 2022 would look rather different to what it's actually turned out to be. Um, as Cameron's mentioned, the Barker decision in the full Cork in 2013 was both long awaited, there had been numerous decisions that had flirted with mutual trust and confidence, but it also proved to be uh, a very short-lived victory. But one thing that I want to mention um, about that full court decision was the values that uh, decision from the majority actually put forward. Because they were the same values that had inspired the House of Lords in the key UK cases to recognise the implied term of mutual trust and confidence. So, in the famous UK case of Malik, Lord Nichols had said that employment is a matter of vital concern to most people, jobs are less secure than they used to be, and the employment contract um, establishes a close personal relationship where there's often a disparity of power between the parties. And the full court took that on board as well. And if you take that on board, there's going to be consequences for how you develop the law, and those consequences are probably going to be to the favour of the employee. Again, the importance of policy is actually emphasised. There's no pretense that policy uh, doesn't creep into legal decisions. The full court put it there fully uh, on, on, on the table and say that implying terms in an area like employment, the outcome of any decision is inevitably informed by policy concerns which reflect the nature of the relationship between the parties. That is a very explicit um, reference to policy. Since then, matters have become uh, rather different. It's not to say, though, that the period in the run-up to Barker in the full court, matters were entirely clear. There's some degree of confusion, I think, at least over terminology in the case law. Um, the terms mutual trust and good faith at this point appear to have been used rather interchangeably. Um, in an article that uh, Joellen uh, Riley uh, wrote, um, 
She points out it had become common for employees claiming damages following termination of the employment to plead that the employer has breached an implied term of good faith, trust and confidence in the employment relationship. And Joellen goes on to point out there's two actual separate things happening here. There's a general concept of good faith which may or may not be part of commercial law in Australia and there's also an employment specific obligation of mutual trust. But I think what's important is that notwithstanding difficulties of terminology, Joellen Riley and another equally distinguished Australian writer, Andrew Stewart, are both firmly of the view that the march towards mutual trust and confidence is, is climbing up the hill and it's only a matter of time before it will actually uh, get there. So direction of travel um, doesn't, doesn't appear to be uh, in doubt. But if we go back to um, the full court in Barker, um, there are significant warning signs in that case. It's also always been the case that the Australian journey displays a degree of inconsistency. Some courts were far more pro, a more radical and modern approach to the employment contract than others. For every case, I think, prior to Barker, favouring mutual trust and confidence, you can find another case that's much more cautious or doubtful about the wisdom of that development. But in Barker itself, the warning signs then become very, very um, strong in the dissenting judgment of Justice Jessup. And I re remember reading this at the time and finding his judgment quite remarkable. And also, I would have to confess, I didn't think it would stand the test of time. But one of us was right and one of us was wrong. In the case, uh, Jessup says that he didn't regard the distinction between the master and servant relationship and the employer-employee relationship as particularly illuminating or helpful. I found that, at the time, truly extraordinary. Um, it seemed to herald a return to an age where the employment contract was always going to favour very strongly the stronger party and the attempt through notions of fair dealing to try and balance up the legal obligations um, would not therefore be set aside if, if you're using the world of master and servant. Again, in uh, that decision, Jessup also is very clear that modern interest in uh, perhaps key attributes of the employment relationship that, that I've mentioned, such as job satisfaction, sense of identity and so on, that's nothing to do with the court. Um, these sorts of notions should not inform the development and subsequent content of the employment contract. And when the decision comes to the High Court, the High Court too are keen to distance themselves from um, you know, this, this modern or new approach to uh, the employment contract. A transformative approach to the law of the employment contract is one that's ruled out. In terms of justification, part of this relates to the constitutional question. What is the proper role of the common law courts and what is the proper role of Parliament? And in Barker in the High Court, the view is taken very firmly that the common law must evolve within the limits of judicial power and must not trespass into what is uh, the role of, of uh, legislation and Parliament. And those limits of judicial power are viewed in narrow terms. The law making function that the common law has is less than it was perhaps viewed uh, before. Reference to the famous British case of Malik that I've mentioned is made, but the fact that Malik took into account what the High Court calls social conditions and desirable social policy, 
That is not for the High Court of Australia. If the UK wants to do that, that's up to the UK, but it's not uh, the Australian way. If you want to transform the employment contract in that bold, brave new world approach, uh, get, get your parliament to do it. So, developing the employment contract by reference to good industrial relations practice, um, psychological conditions, etc., etc., these sorts of factors are for Parliament, not for the courts. And it's also the case that the term relational contract doesn't land particularly well with the High Court of Australia in this case. Um, there's a bit of damning by uh, faint praise. Um, the High Court take the view that these more modern developments appear to be informed by a view of the employment contract as relational, but that is a term of uncertain application and one which uh, they don't actually spend very much time on, but one which clearly they don't actually like terribly much. So that's where the High Court come to in terms of rejecting uh, mutual trust and confidence and also rejecting much of what has been said about a new contemporary approach to the law of the employment contract. But as I mentioned before, in the law of commercial contracts in Australia, relational contracting seemed to be actually taking a stronger hold. Numerous cases existed in commercial cases in Australia imposing obligations of fair dealing and good faith on the parties with perhaps a bit more relish than had been seen in the employment context. So if you like, relational contracting seemed to be perhaps of greater interest to the courts where commercial contracts were concerned. And I think that was probably particularly true in, in, in New, New South Wales. It must be said that the High Court of Australia has never made up its mind uh, on, on that point, though it's perhaps not had the appropriate opportunity to do so. And whether there is a term of good faith that's automatically implied into commercial contracts in Australia, I still, still think that awaits a definitive uh, judgment. But importantly to, for tonight, one area where good faith in commercial contracts was actually uh, often litigated concerned discretionary decisions. And at various decisions such as Far Horizons against McDonald's, the high, sorry, various uh, appellate courts in Australia would take the view that you would, if you had a discretionary power in a commercial contract such as franchise, you couldn't just exercise that power in any manner that you saw fit, even if that exercise was compatible with the express wording. To be fair to both sides, you had to exercise that power in line of good faith and fair dealing. So, for example, you couldn't exercise a power in a way that was arbitrary or capricious or for some extraneous purpose. And obviously, if you can limit uh, the powers of um, in a, a contract of fran franchise, it's a relationship that's somewhat analogous to employment, and if you can do it there, you could do it in employment too. So you've got this quite progressive development taking place in the commercial arena, um, at the same time as there's perhaps more, a bit more of a struggle to establish similar things uh, in, in the law of the employment contract. So, where did we get to when we come to the High Court in Barker in, in 2014? We seem to get to a point where there is a vision for the employment contract, but it's not the same vision as has been adopted in other jurisdictions. It's a clear vision, though. It's a vision that the employment contract is simply one like any other. The employment contract is not special. Perhaps we don't need classes in employment contracts anymore. You just need uh, to discuss the general principles of law of contract, so general principles of contract law, and that um, is enough. And that the fuller dimensions, if you like, of the employment relationship are not to inform the development of the contract. So it's not uh, a social um, 
relationship. It's not uh, a psychological concept like friendship. Uh, it's not really uh, relational. As I mentioned before, that's also linked to, I think, in the decisions of the High Court, an increasing tendency to view the general law of contract in a very conservative manner. So, for example, if we take the notion of sham contracting, key UK cases like uh, Otto Klein's against Belcher and the Uber case, uh, Uber case, one of the numerous ones worldwide where the status of Uber drivers was an issue, UK courts have developed a modern conception of sham contract whereby if the wording of the contract doesn't reflect the reality of the working relationship, uh, the particular term in question can, can be uh, disregarded. The Australian courts seem reluctant to modernise the concept of sham in the same way. And there's some very good writing on this by your colleague Pauline Bombal, uh, who writes about this in an extremely articulate fashion in one of her uh, numerous excellent articles. Again, though, despite the fact that the building blocks are there in Australia, the same traditional notion of sham exists as existed in the UK. There doesn't seem to be a desire to uh, actually modernise it. How much of this matters, though? If I am a worker in any jurisdiction, I'm not particularly concerned about relational contract theory. I'm not particularly concerned about Can Freud. I'm concerned about my rights, so what, what, actually does, what actually matters at the end of the day? Partly because you've got a stronger notion of good faith, I think, than the UK has in the general law of contract, does it matter that the employment contract doesn't have more specific employment obligations of that type? I think it could well do, and I'll come on to that in detail in a bit. I also think that not having regard to wider developments and wider aspects of the employment relationship are going to restrict the growth of the content of the employment contract and put more of a burden on Parliament to intervene. It's also the case that as part of this conservatism, implying terms on the basis of policy certainly where employment is concerned, is likely to be a creature of the past. I think it's much more likely going forward that reference to test and necessity, which the High Court of Australia is now very keen on in employment context, will make it very difficult to usher in bold and exciting and innovative terms. References to old tests of uh, implication, such as you don't actually imply a term unless without that implied term the contract would be worthless or perhaps seriously undermined, are not going to usher in a set of new modern implied obligations. What you will get instead is implied terms which are very much limited to the specific facts of the contract in question. If you look at cases after Barker, in the employment sphere in Australia, there's no sign that relational contracting or contemporary thinking that's evident elsewhere is bouncing back through any other side route. So to mention one, a Harden against Willis, a, a, a routine employment dispute over restraint of trade. When you read that decision, you read a very traditional approach to resolving an employment dispute. The decision is resolved against a framework of general contractual principles and the reference to implied obligations which exist with the employment contract. If someone had been quoting from a book 25 years ago, they would have seen uh, no uh, actual difference. As I've mentioned, uh, where implication was concerned, the test of necessity is mentioned and again borrowing from the High Court of Australia, bargaining power 
and disparity of bargaining power. It might exist, it might not exist. It's not for the courts to have regard to that in resolving a particular dispute. If anyone wants to um, concern themselves with inequality of bargaining power, that's a job for your parliament. So you shouldn't strain language, you shouldn't strain legal concepts in order to address um, what might seem to be perceived unfairness in a particular situation. It's not a legitimate role for the courts. It's, this is very, very traditional. But if that shrewd critic is sitting on my shoulder, she might point out that good faith still exists in the commercial arena in Australia, and that cases since Barker, which deal with discretion decisions in commercial contracts, still use the pre-Barker law. So if I'm a franchisee and I'm worried about the exercise of a price setting power or something on the part of the franchisor, that implied obligation of fair dealing still exists. The franchisee is protected because that power can't be used in a way that's unreasonable or capricious. And that, you know, potentially could be reference, um, so, so it could be of relevance to the employee as well. So if you look at post-Barker cases such as uh, Virk against Yum Restaurants, um, that's an unfranchisee one, um, it's post-Barker, and again the court's very clear that implied constraints still exist on the part um, of, of, of the holder of, of the power. Um, the High Court of Australia has still to determine whether good faith exists, as I've mentioned, as an automatic obligation in a commercial contract, but they haven't ruled it out either. So if all that is still there, does it really matter that there's not the employment specific obligations that I've mentioned? Well, I think it might, because obligations which are of value in the law of contracts as a whole, may not be as appropriate in the employment uh, relationship. They may not be sensitive to the nuances of the employment relationship. And I'll, I'll try and demonstrate that in a variety of ways. Cases in Australia and elsewhere in the commercial sphere that have focused on fair dealing have sometimes taken law further down the road of an obligation of disclosure. If you say in a commercial contract it's relational, well, what, what does that mean? What does that mean for the parties? Well, one thing it might mean is that you have to be much more open. It's not just enough to misrepresent anymore, the old traditional view. You have to be, you know, um, fairer and actually tell the other side more what's going on. So in Valra uh, property, uh, 2019 I think it was, um, that's one of a number of Australian cases um, in a commercial dispute where, depending on the type of contract, it's not all uh, commercial uh, contracts, there may be an obligation to disclose information to the other party uh, because a relational contract is one where there's a higher standard of behavioural expectation. That's what relationships give rise to as opposed to purely transactional uh, relationships. And you might well say, well, OK, um, let's have a bit of disclosure in the employment contract. But that might not be uh, appropriate. And the reasoning in employment cases might be rather different. In uh, the UK, one of the most important uh, decisions on disclosure in the employment uh, sphere is a case called Scali. And what happened in Scali was uh, there was a various pension rights in the um, employee's contract, but those pension rights had to be invoked for a period of time if the employee was to benefit. And the employees weren't aware of this, or properly aware of this, and the time period passed they then discover these rights exist and they try and invoke them and the employer says it's too late. So case goes to the House of Lords and the House of Lords say to the employer, no, no, for the employee to have got the full worth of the bargain, you should have told 
the employees clearly that these rights actually existed. And Scali was a case which was one of the building blocks, I think, in the establishment of the principle of mutual trust and confidence in the UK. But it's been interesting that since then, despite the fact that Scali can be perceived as a case about disclosure and a greater obligation of disclosure, the courts in the UK have been very, very cautious about going further down that road. Some courts have been tempted. The fact that um, mutual trust and confidence exists in Britain is an obligation of the good faith type. Some courts um, have said there's much to be said for, for relaxing the rule about uh, disclosure and that if one party knows they're in breach in a greater range of situations, they should tell the other side. But the courts have held back from that because the consequences are quite significant. When would you have to disclose? So, for example, would you have to tell the employer if you knew that the fellow worker sitting next to you was fiddling their expenses? What would you have to tell the employer? Um, and Scali has actually been developed in a, in a way that's actually very limited compared to uh, what it might have been, uh, when, you know, it was quite a bold decision when it first came out. So my wider point is this, that while an obligation of disclosure might make sense in certain commercial environments, it doesn't necessarily make sense given the somewhat different policy concerns in the law of the employment contract. Again, where uh, discretion is concerned, just because the more general law now takes a view that discretion must be exercised the way that's fairer compared to a traditional approach. It doesn't necessarily mean that all is all going to be hunky-dory in the employment context. In the UK, um, given the existence of mutual trust, a very common form of mutual trust and confidence case is one where the employee says that the employer has not exercised the discretion in a way that's reasonable. And these range from simple cases about mobility, you're, you're told to your new place of work is no longer place A, it's now place B, to cases involving very highly paid employees where the package is eye-watering and it often contains a significant element of bonus. And the courts have been very protective in the UK to make sure that the employer can't, through interpretation or implication, confiscate that bonus when effectively it's already been earned. Now you may say that if you can import uh, constraints from the commercial area, then there's nothing terribly much to worry about. But I'm not entirely sure that's a reliable assumption. I'll explain why. Um, shortly. If you adopt an employment specific approach, you're probably going to be motivated by the concerns I've mentioned, inequality of bargaining power, so on and so forth. So to come back to the Matthews case, the Canadian case I mentioned very early on, Matthews is um, a case about benefits under a long-term incentive plan. What happened in Matthews was that the employee was wrongfully dismissed by the employer. And as part of the damages they, they were after, they wanted the money they would have earned under the long-term incentive plan. A lot of bonus schemes have two key dates. One's the date where it's clear that the employee's done the work or done the activity that entitles them to bonus. And there's a second date which is later in time where they're entitled to the actual payment. Now, a lot of these cases show a cynical view of human relations where the employer uses that gap in time to think of, of a way that they don't actually have to pay out. And in and often there's an express term, as there was in Matthews. So the relevant express term in Matthews was that the agreement shall be of no force and effect if the employee ceases to be an employee and at the date of payment um, they're no longer 
uh, an employee, irrespective of whether the employment is terminated with or without cause. Now, the wording in the case seemed to be extremely clear. Uh, nothing ambiguous about it at all. And before the Court of Appeal in uh, Nova Scotia, they found for the employer they said the, the, the terms unambiguous and the right to recover payment ceases the moment you leave employment. And I actually think if you looked, if you went back to the drafter of that wording, the drafter had done an excellent job, completely professional job, wording spot on. But for the Canadian Supreme Court, motivated by disparity of bargaining power, all that the employment relationships worth to the employee in the round, no, no. Um, the employee wins. Uh, basically, um, the language didn't suffice, and the court emphasises that any exclusion clause must clearly cover the precise circumstances which have arisen, and they use that to say um, no, no recovery. Now, to my mind, I don't think that would have happened in a commercial case because your wording is actually crystal clear, parties to the relationship have got rough bargaining power, uh, equally, equally um, rough bargaining power, um, I, I don't think you would have got that. So the robustness of that uh, position in Matthews is because the court are coming at it from an employee friendly stance and they're coming at it from a need to protect the weaker party to the employment relationship. And I know there are distinguished corporate lawyers in the audience, but it seems to me it's a bit like the way you protect minority shareholders in a way that you don't allow expropriation uh, of, of um, their share in, in the business. Um, but when you come to commercial cases, it may well be different, and we've seen signs of that in the UK. So, there's a very interesting journey in the UK. Um, a lot of the early mutual trust and confidence cases were about regulation of discretion. And they actually prompted a reform in commercial law in the UK. And that's not just um, my view. Um, Lady Justice Arden, writing I think in the Journal of Contract Law in 2013, says this, that the employment cases have helped the commercial cases in the UK demonstrate a greater element of fair dealing. Now, what's happened since then, though, is that the commercial cases have taken a step back and have become more uh, restrictive. Partly they've taken a fundamental view fun uh, as to what amounts to a discretion. And they've taken a narrower view than has been taken in employment cases as to what is a discretionary decision in, in, in nature. So, for example, if a clause in a contract, in a commercial case, is expressed as being an absolute right, if you exercise that absolute right, that, according to quite a number of commercial cases now in the UK, that's not the exercise of a discretion. To a more simple-minded person like me, you've still got a choice as to whether you exercise the contract or not, exercise the power or not, but it's not for uh, the courts in these commercial cases. It's an absolute right. Again, they say in a number of cases, if you've got a clause that only offers a binary choice, it's either A or B, that's not enough to be a discretionary matter. Uh, a discretionary decision must be wider than that. Now, I know from the, the writings of, of Wayne Courtney that discretion is also contested in Australia. And my concern would be that if you are looking toward a more general contractual framework, that certainly over time is likely to be much more restrictive than the position would be uh, in, in the uh, em employment context. So, to my mind, it does matter that even if you can look to notions of good faith and fair dealing, it's likely in many cases to give uh, different results to the ones that you'd expect if you were approaching decisions from 
um, the various policy concerns that I've referred to uh, earlier uh, this evening. Cameron mentioned at the beginning that I would touch upon statute as well. So, it's worth considering whether statute might be a catalyst or constraint, as it were, might it inform future developments. If it does inform future developments, will statute help uh, the world be more relational where the employment contract is concerned? I think not. Um, increasingly, I think in both systems, the sheer extent of the amount of statutory intervention in the employment and labour law fields mean that the courts see little scope for additional common law development. And I think that's particularly true in Australia, more so perhaps uh, than, than uh, the position would be in the UK. Um, and indeed, some uh, particular statutory measures might have a, a clear negative impact on common law development. Uh, Johnson against Unisys in the UK and New South Wales against Page at, at a stage when in Australia mutual trust and confidence was still a, a possibility both took the view that because dismissal was protected by the statute there was no scope left for the common law to intervene uh, and I think increasingly that's going to be the case uh, in both jurisdictions. It is of course the case that statute from time to time can be uh, a catalyst. Um, a good Australian example is the case of Romero against Farstead Shipping. A decision about bullying and harassment in the workplace, which unfortunately two of the sort of key issues of, of, of the day for all of us in all, all systems. And that was a case about uh, a policy that the employer had on workplace bullying and harassment. And the question was, was it incorporated into the employment contract? And the employer said it, it, it wasn't. And part of the employer's argument was, well, you don't need to incorporate anything here because there's protection in legislation. But the court took the absolute opposite view. The court took the view that legislation was embodying the same values and that what the employer uh, was doing through the policy, was actually trying to make the legislation more effective and that pointed towards incorporation. So undoubtedly uh, legislation can be a catalyst but I think a greater awareness of the constitutional question I mentioned earlier, you know, the proper distinction between the role of the common law, the role of, of parliament, is likely to lead to a cautious view where any potential stimulus of, um, from the legislation uh, is, is concerned. There's also a difficulty, I think, that in both systems there's a limited amount of development of over overarching principles as to when it's appropriate to have regard to statute to develop the common law. And McLeish writing in the Melbourne University Law Review uh, in 2014 makes this point, and I'm not sure how far beyond that we've gone in, in either, either system. I should say as well that if we are concerned with the notion of a progressive contract, a relational contract if you like, if the foundations of that contract are in the law made by the judges, those foundations may be somewhat unstable. So. I'm not here tonight to suggest that because the UK has perhaps gone further down this road, employees can sleep easy in their beds. Uh, apparent victories uh, in judicial decisions may be somewhat short-lived. So let me say a bit more about that. So in the recent Uber decision in the UK, Uber argued that the drivers were self-employed. and. Supreme Court, on a, a basis that's unanimous, takes a view that they're, they're not. Um, but while this case has been 
universally viewed as, 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 as correct, progressive, etc., etc., there's some very odd remarks about inequality of bargaining power. Or perhaps not odd, I think worrying remarks about inequality of bargaining power. The court says, we know that various people nowadays um, go on and on about inequality of bargaining power being very significant in the law of the employment contract. But the employment contract, the court says, isn't special in that regard. What about things like consumer contracts and so on and so forth? And it seems to me once you question you know, the special attributes of the employment contract, you might be on a slippery slope to uh, a world where you say, well, we shouldn't treat the employment contract quite so differently after all. Now, whether anything will come of that in the UK or not, I don't know. But um, there's perhaps worrying signs there. And it may be that Uber in the eyes of the Supreme Court, was very much influenced by the fact that if the Uber drivers were self-employed, then various statutory rights fell away. So if it hadn't been a statutory case, might there be a different um, uh, answer? Well, who knows? Um, but the, the, the foundations may be somewhat uh, unstable. So by way of conclusion, everyone, I would suggest that looking at a number of major decisions that the High Court of Australia has made from Barker onwards, a very conservative outlook is being advanced where the employment contract is concerned. And if progressive developments are to come, I think they are to come from uh, the, you know, um, the legislation in Australia. I don't think it's extreme to say that if the House of Lords in the UK of the 1950s had viewed these decisions, they would say that's exactly the right thing to do. So I think you know, we're, we've gone back in time, I think, uh, a great deal. I've tried to argue tonight that this is not simply a theoretical dispute. I think it could have uh, practical consequences in a number of future cases. It would seem to me that given the rejection of the approaches in comparable jurisdictions, the label relational contract is no longer appropriate in the Australian context. Of course, it may be that if the commercial cases continue to have a notion of fair dealing in them, it may be that there is um, relational contracting is still um, of, of utility in the Australian system, but it's just a different form of relational contract. Again, a number of people would view the term relational contract with um, a degree of caution. What does it actually mean? What does it actually tell us? It might simply be shorthand to, to inform us that the employment contracts like to be ongoing and that greater attention needs to be paid to issues such as variation and dispute uh, resolution. For others, it perhaps means more, and that it means that the relational contract has certain values, certain values which can be expressed in legal terms by notions of fair dealing and good faith. So, um, I think there's, there's a, a, a question to be had as to how valuable the term is, but certainly the Australian courts are rejecting, I think, a number of contemporary developments, which by and large have been very much to uh, the, the benefit of uh, em employees. At the outset, I, I said I had, I had never met Philippa, uh, but if I might be forgiven an element of presumption, uh, I would suggest, that, like me, she'd be greatly enthused and inspired by this excellent work that's going on in Australia at the moment by so many labour law scholar scholars. I was made even more firmly um, aware of that um, when I spoke at the Australian Labour Law Association last week, um, utterly stimulating uh, just what's happening in this jurisdiction. And a, a colleague who encouraged and inspired so many and was clearly hugely collegial, I think would have enjoyed the, all of that I, I, as much as I did. So it's been a pleasure to speak to you this evening and I hope that's been of interest. So.